Well, good morning. So we are continuing on through our series in Luke, um, kind of the sub series called Greatness, looking at the greatness of God. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 9, verses 49 and 50. We're actually just unpacking two verses um, this week. And so uh, there's a lot chalked up in there. There's a lot to, to kind of glean from it. So um, so just two verses we'll be looking at, and then we'll have a couple of verses in Philippians as well. As you're turning there, when you guys leave here today, um, assuming you're not fasting, but everyone's going to go from here, one of, one of the great traditions of the South is lunch after uh, church. You know, the after church lunch, where are we going to go eat for lunch? Or maybe you got something in the slow cooker and getting ready uh, for uh, for lunch when you get home. But whenever you go home today for lunch, you're going to have beef, pork, chicken, or fish. You're going to have one of those, okay? Unless you're vegetarian and I, I don't count you. Um, but anyway, most of you are going to have beef, pork, chicken, or fish. And then for dinner tonight, you're going to have beef, pork, chicken, or fish. And then for breakfast, you're going to have beef, pork, chicken, or fish. It's amazing. Every meal, we have some variation of a beef, whether it's a steak or a hamburger, a meatball. It could be pork. It could be pork chop. It could be bacon. It could be chicken. And Lord knows there are a million different ways of making chicken. And then there's fish. You know, there's fish, there's shrimp, there's, you know, uh, shark, there's mahi, there's all these different kinds of fish. And so we have all different variations of these things, but it's basically the same thing. It's basically multiple versions of the same four things. And the same kind of goes with the church. It comes in all types of flavors. And though we may like a particular flavor more than the other, it doesn't negate the effectiveness of the other. You know, there are conservative church, uh, traditional churches uh, that you, you go to First Baptist downtown and they have the multi-million dollar pipe organ. And so when they play it, boom, oh, you know, and, and so they have the big high church hymns. And I think they just stopped singing Latin a few weeks ago. I mean, I, I'm just joking. Uh, but, you know, so very, very high church. And the and Pastor Blaylock, when he goes to speak, he still wears the, the robe the, 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 and, and that kind of thing. And the, the same goes with a lot of our uh, liturgical denominations denominations, our Episcopal denominations, things like that. They're, they're very regal and very formal in how they approach things. And then you go to the other extreme and you go to the Pentecostal churches and during the worship and you got, you know, four or five old ladies up front and they got the tambourines and they're going and everyone's just running around and flopping around like a fish out of water, bumblebee tie my bow tie and going all over the place. And so you have that extreme over there. And then you got, you know, then you have the other churches, you got the Baptist, you know, on the Baptist side of things, you have the frozen chosen. And so you have those guys that just, you know, you, they just stand there and say, I'm at church, leave me alone. You have those guys and you have our side of the Baptist denomination that we're just like, you know, we don't care. Hey, we're having a good old time. We love Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's go, you know. And so all of these experiences, we all like different things. I mean, so some of us, you're like, man, I love that your church has pews. And I remember when we moved into this place, I said, you know, there's just something kind of old fashioned and beautiful and quaint about a church with pews and then you sit in them and it's like, yeah, I don't like this anymore. You know, they, these are uncomfortable. They're horrible, you know? And so, uh, and, and so, you know, you have people that are pew people. You have people that are chair people. You have people that, you know, that, uh, I, there was a guy about a year ago. He's like, that's not a Baptist church. And I'm like, yeah, I, I went to a Baptist school. <laughs> I, I did the whole thing, you know, I'm Baptist and everything. And he's like, Y'all play drums in your church. That ain't no Baptist church. You know, I'm like, okay, you know. And, and so, you know, there are people that are drum people. There are people that are not drum people. And so churches, even on John's Island, even the small town of John's Island, there's multiple flavors of church. But there's different ways of getting it done. It's different ways of getting the gospel out to people. And so we're going to unpack that a little bit uh, this morning um, in uh, just these uh, few short verses. So let's 
read Luke chapter 9, verses 49 through 50. So John answered, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, do not stop him. For the one who is not against you is for you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit would so fill this place that it would not allow me to speak a word that does not first come from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're continuing on through this, through this narrative. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we looked at the transfiguration. And then a couple of weeks, then the week after that, we looked at how uh, Jesus came down from the mountain and got slapped in the face with reality. And so he got frustrated because these, these disciples that he's been training, he's empowered through the Holy Spirit to do, and they could not do it because they didn't grasp the, the, uh, the, um, the, the largeness, the seriousness of the sin uh, that was uh, involved uh, with casting out of demons. And so there's, this, there's still this, this disconnect between the disciples and the mission that Jesus was training them for, okay? And so this is still going on. And in um, and, and verse 44, 45, uh, Jesus foretells his um, death. And then um, last week we talked about who is the greatest. An argument arose among them. They started talking about who is great. Jesus brought the child, and he says, whoever would look receives this child. My name receives me. And so Jesus is still teaching them. And out of this moment, it didn't say that, you know, there, there's no separation in time here. This is still in the same moment going on. And so Jesus says, for he who is least among you all, the one, is, the one who is, is the one who is great. And John answered, so it's like, yeah, yeah, okay, 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 got it. We're supposed to be least, got it, okay. But we're not as bad as those guys. And so he goes on and says, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop them. Why? Because they weren't part of our group. They weren't part of our club. They weren't part of our, 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 our disciple, you know, ship huddle. They're not part of that. And, and so it, it, when, I, when you look at this, you recognize this is a continuing saga of the disciples where we look at them and say, what are you thinking? I mean, you know, because, of course, when we look at the Bible, we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we look at Andrew, we look at all these disciples who did all of them, did great things for the cause of the early church, all of them sacrificed, and all of them were martyred in the name of Christ. And they, we, we look at them, and we should see them with reverence and respect. But in these early days, we can look at them because we have the hindsight of knowing the rest of the book. But we can look at these disciples and go, what are you thinking? Really? I mean, really, really you're, 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 you're going to sit here and you're going, to make, you're, you're going to chastise this man who is casting out demons, not in his name, but in Jesus' name. It says, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in whose name? In Jesus' name. And we tried to stop him because he does not follow with us. Now, just nine verses previously, the disciples were being admonished and were being chastised by Jesus for not being able to do the very thing that they were trying to get this other guy to stop doing. I mean, how crazy is that? It's like, hey, knock that off. You're not in our club. Forget about the fact that we couldn't do that and you're doing it, but still, stop. I mean, it's kind of crazy. And so we're, 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 you know, the, the, it's, it's, when, when I look at that, I, oh, man, there, we'll, we'll jump into this later because I don't want to get ahead of myself. But there's so many transferable principles here about how when someone else is doing something and they're not doing it the way we think they should be doing it, we tend to want to stop them. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. It's in Jesus' name. Jesus is getting glorified. People are coming to the Lord. Celebrate. We're seeing that the movement of Christ is taking root. Because let me tell you, when the mission is captured outside of the inner circle, 
you have a movement. When the mission is taking root outside the inner circle, like when all of a sudden I expect our leaders, I expect our deacons and our elders, our, I expect our leaders to know the mission of Live Oak Church. I expect our our leaders to know love God, love people, live boldly. And I expect them to know what that means and how we are as a church to accomplish it. That's the mission. Now, when all of a sudden, people who are outside of that close inner circle, the, the leadership circle, when all of you begin to take root, when all of you who are watching, when I hear people in the community that are just barely connected to Live Oak Church, understanding the mission of Live Oak Church and stating the mission, hey, go check out Pastor Sean or go check out Live Oak Church because they're good folk and they'll help you out. When that starts happening out beyond our inner circle, that's when it's no longer just the mission, it's a movement. And that's when you start getting excited because you're moving forward. Now God's, God's um, purpose is moving. And so now what Jesus is seeing is that his mission is taking root because it's getting outside the inner circle. And now people are kind of taking ownership of the message that he has shared and are out there doing it. And now the mission is becoming a movement. So let's, I want, I want to examine this because we have this, this situation here. And so, I want, okay, it's two verses. How in the world am I going to communicate all there is to communicate out of just two verses? And so what I want to do is I want to take these two verses, but I want to look at it from the perspective of everyone involved, because really it, it is, it's important when you look at every one of these characters. So let's first look at, uh, from the perspective of the demon possessed man, the man who was possessed with the demon, the man who was sick, the man who came to be healed. He didn't stop to look at the credentials of this man. He didn't stop and first interview and say, okay, excuse me. Um, how many actual hours have you had to train with Jesus of Nazareth before I allow you to pray for me? He didn't go to do that. He didn't go and he's, he didn't say, okay, um, could I see any credentials? Did you go to, um, which seminary did you go to before I will let you pray for me? No, see, this was a man who was desperate and just needed healing. This man was claiming, uh, the, 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 the man who was healing was claiming to be a disciple of Jesus and people knew that meant power. People began to hear that Jesus equals power, that Jesus equals healing, that Jesus equals something getting done. And so this man was claiming to be a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus. And so he went to the man. He didn't care how close in the inner circle he was. This is a follower of Jesus. Jesus is a healer. Jesus brings power. I need that. And so from the perspective of the demon possessed man, he didn't care who this person was or how closely connected to Jesus was. He just needed the power of Jesus. From the perspective of the man driving out the demons, so we, we don't know his name. We don't know anything about him. We don't know uh, uh, really much of anything. We don't know how he came to follow Jesus. We don't know what teaching he overheard. Or maybe he was in the crowd where the disciples were working. It's not clear. I mean, was he in there? What Was he there when Jesus taught and healed? And he said, oh, my. And, and the Holy Spirit just got a hold of him. And he, he became a follower from a distance. We don't know. Maybe it wasn't Jesus at all. Maybe one of the disciples were out there proclaiming Jesus and healing people in Jesus' name. And maybe he just said, I want that. You know, sometimes when, when, you're, when you're outside of the faith and you're hungry and you're thirsty and you just want something, you're searching for something, and it may not be a church service that brings you to Jesus. You may see someone in here. You may be out there and you saw someone that, that, that was just leaking Jesus, leaking the Holy Spirit, and you saw them and said, I want that. That's why it's so important. For you to live the gospel out there, that's the living boldly. For you to be out there, to share that people know, one, 
that you're a person of integrity, that you're a person of power, but where that power comes from is from Jesus. And so that person, they may not have gotten the first experience in a church service. Their first impression of the power of Jesus Christ actually came from watching you live live that out. (coughs) So we don't know where the man driving out demons came from. However, I do believe that his motives were pure. Why? Well, how can I make that assumption? I can make that assumption based on two things. One, um, it, it, it appears that the demons were cast out. Um, it didn't say, uh, Master, we saw someone trying to cast out demons in your name. It says that they were casting out demons in your name. So, one, the man was, um, uh, the man was successful at casting out these demons. And two... Jesus didn't stop him. And so I believe that this man's motives were pure, that he was simply a follower of Jesus and he was trying to accomplish the mission of Jesus Christ. So from the perspective of now the apostles, here was a man who'd never been with them as they attended Jesus' seminars and they had never been with him and they'd never been to his prayer times and they'd never been there to, to, to hear Jesus counseling. They, he's never been there to hear the sermons. The man hadn't seen the miracles that they had seen. All he had was a message that they'd preached. He had received reports of Jesus' mighty works and he had believed that this was the promised Messiah. And he had gone out to God in his name and put his trust in Jesus and his life had been transformed. Just like the lives of many of us. You never saw with your own eyes or heard with your own ears the the preaching of Jesus. You never saw the things that Jesus has done. You've never seen the miracle. You've never heard the Sermon on the Mount with your own ears. We, We read God's word. We read the account of others from what Jesus did and we believe it's the same with this man. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, people like myself, we all bear witness to you of this reality and the truth that you believed. And then when you told others about the same Jesus, some of them also began to believe and their lives were transformed and they began to pray for others and they be, their, their prayers began to allow healing to take place and then they began to lead others to, and that's how this works. But they were concerned about the unity of the disciples of Jesus. I, I, I think about this and I think about times in my own life, some some weak moments in my leadership. If you want to find an insecure leader or, or an ineffective leader, a leader who has to control every facet of everything. I need to know who's doing what. I need to control everything that's happening because I can't allow my people to take ownership. And the disciples were kind of feeling that way. They were concerned about the unity of the disciples. What was, was the land going to be filled? Was our world going to be filled with individual disciples who just did their own thing? I mean, crazy. Responsible to no one but themselves? Wouldn't this, be a result, wouldn't this result in chaos? Men who were still novices would be setting themselves up as Christian rabbis and preaching to all. And you would look at that and you would say, that's a valid concern. And I would say, and it happened. And as you study after Jesus left, and if you study, look at the book of Acts, you look at the early church, yes, this did happen. Some people, you know, ended up kind of going astray. Some people began to preach, you know, uh, different versions of the gospel, and they kind of were, weren't held accountable. And that still happens today. But Jesus is still the Lord of the church. False prophets will be found out. The truth will rise up. So that's how the demon-possessed man saw it. That's how the man driving out the demon saw it. That's how the apostles saw it. How did Jesus see it? Well, Jesus saw it one of two ways. The work he came to do was being done. I have to say, if I were to place myself in his 
shoes for a moment after I had a series of disappointing conversations with my inner circle. And I, hey, we saw a guy and he was casting out demons in your name. Again, very important three words, in your name. And we told him to stop. And if I was Jesus, I'd be like, <sighs> at least someone is doing it, you know? At least someone has gas grasped this mission. At least someone is out there doing it. I believe that Jesus was like, yes, okay, it is taking root. People are getting the mission. They are accomplishing the mission. So I think there was a, a level of, uh, of excitement in Jesus' spirit that the work he came to do was being done. And also... Audrey and I were talking about this as I was unpacking the sermon to her earlier this week. When Jesus says, do not stop him for the one who is not against you is for you. Again, Jesus is coming down off the mountain and the whole purpose is pivoting towards Jerusalem. You think maybe, maybe he knew what was coming. Maybe he knew that there is much um, confrontation that was heading his way. Maybe even, maybe even the pain of the cross. Maybe even the abuse that he took. Maybe he knew that was coming. And he's like, guys, listen. There's going to be people who are truly against us. You know what? If there's some guys for us out here, let's leave them alone. Let's let them do their thing. Because there are really people out there that are against Jesus. There are people out there that have... have, have um, uh, negative uh, would be a, 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 a slight word that, that have dangerous views towards the church and the gospel and they would like to see nothing other than it be eradicated from our culture. There are real people, real organizations. There is a spiritual warfare and the enemy is gaining ground here in our culture. So there are real people out there that want to see us decimated as a church, as a faith in our culture. And so Jesus was pivoting and he saw all that coming. He's like, you know what? They're on our side. Let's leave them alone. That's how Jesus saw it. Paul speaks to this as well um, later on as the church was established in uh, Philippians chapter 1. So in verse 15, and this goes to what we were saying, you know, that, that, you know, that the disciples may have been concerned about, you know, false teachers and false, false prophets. Well, you know, Paul speaks to that in Philippians. He says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am here put for the defense of the gospel. And the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Not everybody is doing it for the right reasons. Not everybody is doing it properly. Not everybody is doing it with the, with, with the right doctrines or the right, you know. But he's like, you know what? If, if Jesus is proclaimed, we rejoice, and we clean it up after but we need, to pro we need to rejoice. Anytime someone is out there proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, we rejoice. I don't care if there's drums on the pulpit or if there, everybody's in daggum uh, choir robes singing badly because... <clears throat> and by the way, I love this. I love how some of us, there, it's been all over Facebook where there's like the three people that are singing and they're singing that hymn and it was so heavenly. And it's like, Remember when church sounded like that? And it's like, your church never sounded like that. You never had singers that good. It was like 
14 people in a choir, none of them could carry a tune. And so, you know, so stop. Could we just stop romanticizing? You know, you know for one thing, Marty and, and, and the team up here, I never leave here going, questioning whether or not we truly set you guys up for worship. Whether you worship or not, that's on you. But man, Marty prepares these guys. These guys are worshiping. They're not performing. They're not doing, they are worshiping and they're just bringing you with them. And so we should rejoice with that. And so I am glad I will stand up and I will, you know, it's like if you want to get into this whole style of worship thing, no, this is exactly where we want to be. Okay, and so, you know, but if, if there are people, if you prefer the, the choirs and the big organs and everything, fine, fine. If you go to, to, to the seacoast of the world or the new springs of the world and they've got the smoke machines and, the, you know, and they're ripping guitars in the name of Jesus, whatever. Is Jesus being proclaimed? If the gospel of Jesus is being proclaimed, then the other stuff is messed up. Because let me tell you, there are some churches that would lose their ever love and mind that we have a coffee shop in our sanctuary. Whatever. These are, these are ridiculous things. The gospel of Jesus Christ is being proclaimed. That's what's important. Now, I'm not saying that anyone who does anything in Jesus' name should be applauded. I'm not saying if anyone, if they just tag in Jesus' name of bad doctrine, that they should be applauded or accepted. We should be wary of false prophets even today. We should be wary of bad teachers even today. I'm not talking about what they say from the pulpit. I'm talking about the style in which they say it. There are great, great preachers of the faith that stand behind a lectern and they give a, 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 an academical uh, perspective of God's word. And then there are preachers that have to have a handkerchief because they jumping and they shouting and they getting it going. I'm talking style here. I'm not talking about substance. As far as I'm concerned, if they, number one, support the claim of Christ to be the only way to God. His word says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There is no redemption in any, anything or anyone else. The sole Savior of sinners is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Jesus Christ. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which men can be saved. There is only one God, and that's Jesus. So if you preach that from the pulpit, that's a good thing. Now, as opposed to some churches that are beginning to kind of slip into the fact that Jesus is a way, they're slipping into a theology called universalism, where Jesus is God, but we also still must respect that Muhammad is an access to God and that Buddha is an access to God and that all of these other ways, our accesses, our routes, our, our, our avenues to God, just as Jesus is an avenue to God. If you say that, you're a heretic and you are not preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care how great your worship is. I don't care how great the preaching is. I don't care how great the environment is or how great the youth ministry is. If they are not preaching that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, they are not preaching the gospel. Number two, if they support the claims that Jesus was sent into the world as the Lamb of God to bear away the sin of the world, he said that he came not to be served but to serve and gave his life as a ransom for many. As opposed to churches that may preach the idea that Jesus was a prophet, a good teacher. No, Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. He was not just a teacher. He was a great teacher. He was a revolutionary teacher. If you want to learn how to be a leader, if you want to, then look to Jesus. If you want to learn how to be a good teacher, look to Jesus. If you want to learn how to be a good uh, 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 
anything, you look to Jesus. But that is not, he is not just a teacher. He is not just a leader. He is not just a revolutionary. He is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the name above all names. He is the Son of God. And so if you preach that, then you are preaching the gospel of Jesus. And then thirdly, if you support Christ's warnings about sin, because Christ did warn about sin. You know, people act like Jesus' only message is to love God and love people. People act like the only message he has was to have peace. But Jesus, people also forget to mention that Jesus spoke against sin. People forget to mention that Jesus spoke against greed and against uh, 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 pride. And he, he spoke passionately, especially against the church who was not living up to what God called them to be. So if you preach that there is such a thing as sin, see today too often in churches, there are too many churches, too many preachers, too many people that don't want to talk about sin. And I don't, and I don't go up here, let me tell you, you need not to do this. I, you know, what preacher, well, there are some preachers that like just being negative all the time and, you know, uh, you know, preaching sin. I mean, I don't, I don't want to preach sin. I want to tell you how to get to Jesus. I don't want to tell you how, you know, give you a list of what not to do. Because you can, you can not do all these of our favorite sins, by the way, and we kind of leave out the ones that we struggle with. But I can give you a list of sins to stay away from. It doesn't matter if you stay away from all those sins, but you forget to surrender to Jesus. It doesn't matter about this list if you forget this one. And so, you know, and so, so, but we support Christ's warnings about sin. We don't just certain, we don't, we don't justify everything. Well, God's grace covers everything. God's grace does cover everything, but once you surrender and submit and repent, it's not a get out of hell free card that, that I surrender to Jesus. Now I can do whatever I want because Jesus will forgive me. It's not how it works. But if you support that Jesus is the way, if you support that Jesus is the Messiah, if you support his warnings about sin, then absolutely I don't care how they do it. If they're proclaiming the gospel, then we say, hallelujah, how can we pray? How can we support? How can we help get it out there? I told you guys before that as a church planter, according to the Southern Baptist Convention, I am considered a missionary, not a pastor. Um, I think I got a few more years before they'll consider me a pastor. But right now as a church plant, we're still considered missionaries. Well, it's interesting because when we train for church planting, we have to do what's called contextualizing your environment. The same thing you would do. Let's say that, you know, Beth and Mike, you know, God got a hold of them and they decided to go to you know, Zimbabwe to be missionaries. Well, we're not, you know, the, 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 the convention, we're not just saying, all right, go, you know, no, you know, they're like, nope, we're way too Southern, way too white. No. Okay. And so they would have to go. They'd have to learn about the culture. They have to learn how do we bring Jesus to this culture? Well, the same thing for a church planner, me and Andre, we spent months figuring out John's Island and it turns out we needed months more, you know, because John's Island, weird. You know, it's like, I thought, well, I lived in James Island for five years. It's just across the bridge. And then we started spending time over here. It's like, this is not the same at all. I mean, it's different. And so we had, but, you know, every, when, when you're a church, if you're truly out there to, to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the people, you have to contextualize every church isn't going to fit every, every scenario. And so Jesus was like, leave him alone. If he's not against us, he's for us. And so we as a church, I say this all the time. I've, I've met most of the pastors here on the island. I, I, I'm here to, uh, listen, we're the new kid on the block, but we're, I'm here to support. Is there anything I can do? Is there anything we can do to support Seacoast, to support First Baptist, to support the Lutheran Church across the street, to support the, uh, the, the Catholic Church, you know, down the street, to whoever we can. If they're out there proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, we want to be part of that kingdom work. 
Because whoever is not against us is for us. So how do we apply this? Number one, we, as individuals, as our church, as our denomination, need to recognize that we don't have a monopoly on what is right and on how to do church. We need to be humble in that. We, I hope everybody who is at Live Oak is a fan of Live Oak. We have a Discover membership class because we want you to know why we do worship the way we do, why we do everything the way we do, so that you can't come and say, I don't like that. Well, you signed up, you know? So uh, this is how we are. We need to recognize that we don't have a monopoly on what is right and how to do church. Number two, we need to recognize that some people, even though those who are not as quote-unquote qualified, can be effective at accomplishing God's mission. I mean, I went, I've got 25 years of ministry experience, which some of that is actually hurt, hurtful more than helpful. You know, I went to Bible college. I went to seminary. I tell people oftentimes I'm educated way beyond my intelligence. But there are some of you guys that, you, you know, some people that they just have a knack because God has given you the, the, the gift of knowledge and the gift of interpretation. And you read God's word and you're like, it makes sense to you. It just clicks. God, the Holy Spirit just is able, it, your eyes are opened and and it doesn't matter what degree you have. It doesn't matter what learning you have. God can qualify you if you're willing to be used. Number three, we need to recognize that it's God's mission will be accomplished. Sounds trite and cliche, but read the back. We, he wins in the end. There is a struggle throughout. There is a struggle throughout. But at the end of the day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ will, is Lord. But we need to recognize that God's mission will be accomplished. We need to make sure that we are doing everything we can to encourage God's mission and never, ever, ever hinder God's mission. We want to provide an opportunity. We want to provide oxygen whenever we have an opportunity to see God's will be done. We want to breathe oxygen into that. We never, ever want to stifle the move of the Holy Spirit in and around our church, our people, our community. So how do we respond? What do we do with this? Number one, how are you being used by Jesus to accomplish his mission? How are you? What, what, what are you doing to accomplish his mission? And as Marty and them play, you know, there's going to be some questions that are going to um, scroll on the screen. I just want you to be thinking and praying through for opportunities to share the gospel like this man who didn't get the charge from Jesus. This man didn't, the, Jesus didn't go to this man and say, hey, go and cast out demons. No, he said, you know what? I, I, I heard the message of Jesus and there's demons to be cast out, so I'm going to go out and I'm going to cast out demons. He just went out and did it. What is out there that what, what is out there that you're like, you know what? I don't need Pastor Sean to tell me to do it. There's people out there that need help. I'm going to go help. There's people out there that need reach and I'm going to go reach. I don't need a campaign. I don't need, you know, a, a specific word from the pastor. I'm going to go out and do it. May we need to be praying for humility. May we need to be praying for those whom we disagree. Maybe there have been arguments during this time. It seems like, oh man, we, we live in such a divided culture. And I know I say this a lot, but it, it is truly the biggest, it is truly the biggest sin of our day. And I, and I get it. I mean, it seems like everything's extreme. I was talking to someone the other day. It was like, you know, I was watching the news, which you should never do. 
But I was watching the news and it said, well, there are 14% of undecided voters. How in the world can you be undecided right now? I get it back in the day when the Democrats and the Republicans, there was very little difference. They were both two sides of the rotten coin. But now, and, and I'm not saying that Republicans are righteous these days, but I'm just saying as far as their, what they believe in is so different. How could you be like, I don't know. Because we're a divided culture right now. How, we need to humble ourselves and still be able to eat, disagree, but love. And it should never enter our church. I tell people, Facebook, it's mainly you folk and family folk and some church folk. But my Twitter account is mostly pastors and leaders and people like that that I follow. And they're some of the worst. You know, they're out there, you know, this preacher is horrible. because, And they give 14 reasons why this preacher is horrible. I'm like, that's a lot of time to spend on negativity, ripping someone else, spreading the kingdom, spreading the gospel. That's a lot of negativity in your heart. Maybe we as a church need to examine ourselves and say, how can we bring peace? Blessed are the peacemakers, not the peace havers, the peacemakers. We're to make peace. So maybe we need to humble our spirits for those whom we disagree. So we're just going to take a few moments to pray, and then we'll uh, respond to Jesus, and then we'll take up the offering in just a moment.